Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be continuing to look at the book of Revelation by looking at Revelation chapter 16 verses 1 through 9. Revelation 16 verses 1 through 9. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at the pouring out of God's wrath in bowls number 1 through 4. Uh, please keep in mind that we've been looking at God's wrath falling during the last days. We looked at the fact that uh, all of God's wrath that falls during the last days is pictured as seven trumpets. The seventh trumpet, however, is divided up into seven different symbolic illustrations of God's wrath. Those seven illustrations of God's wrath found in trumpet number seven are described as bowls or vials of wrath that are being poured out. That's what we're looking at this morning. We're looking at the first four of those bowls of wrath that are contained by the seventh trumpet. These are God's wrath against Satan's kingdom. Okay, so you have to keep in mind prior to this in trumpets one through six, basically it was describing God's wrath against sinful mankind in general. So when Christ comes back at the second coming, one of the things that will take place is he's going to send his wrath against lost mankind in general. But here in trumpet number seven, in other words, the seven bowls of wrath, we're going to see that God's wrath is not only poured out against lost mankind in general, but especially it's poured out against Satan and his kingdoms. And that's what these seven bowls of wrath are going to be pointed towards, Satan and his kingdom. Okay, so we'll be seeing that as we progress through our study. There's one more interesting thing I did want to mention. There are some good Bible teachers who believe that trumpet, uh, trumpets 1 through 7 are speaking about the same judgments as vials 1 through 7. And they point to the fact that there are several similarities between the seven trumpets and the seven vials. So in their mind, it appears as if the vials are simply repeating the same basic judgments that the trumpets were. Okay, let me just say this in response to that. It's true. In some cases, the vials and the trumpets are similar. But let me tell you, in some cases, they're very, very different. What I would like to do is just give you a quick comparison before we get started in our verse-by-verse -verse study. A quick comparison of the trumpets compared to the vials. Uh, by the way, I have a table with all these comparisons listed out for you. If you go to settledinheaven.wordpress.com, I have the text version of this message. It's entitled uh, Revelation 16, 1 through 9, the pouring out of bowls 1 through 4. If you find that lesson on my text blog, you're going to see a table that clearly points out the differences and the similarities between trumpets 1 through 7 and vials 1 through 7. But for today's video lesson, I just wanted to point out very quickly, I'll read down through the table, to help you understand there are similarities between the two, but there are also differences between the two. That's why I believe the seven vials are talking about different judgments than the seven trumpets. Okay, trumpet number one involved hail, hail fire, and blood. Vial number one speaks about the sores that come upon men. Trumpet number two was a burning mountain, the sea being changed to blood. Well, sure enough, in that case, it is similar. Vial number two involves the sea being changed to blood. In trumpet number three, we saw the star fall from heaven, and that resulted in rivers and fountains being turned to blood. Well, once again, it's similar. In vial number three, we find rivers and fountains turned to blood as well. In uh, trumpet number four, it's a plague of darkness. Well, I'll tell you, in vial number four, it's the exact opposite. It's the sun shining brightly, scorching men. So even though both the trumpet and the vial involves the sun, it truly is a different type of judgment. The one is a judgment of darkness. The other one is a judgment of burning. Trumpet number five sends locusts upon men. Vial number five is different. That involves darkness and pain coming upon men. 
Trumpet number six <clears throat> involves the four angels and if you remember that army of 200 million. Vial number six talks about four kings and three spirits. And we'll get to these, you'll understand more as we get through and look at each of these vials one by one. So uh, trumpet number six and vial number six are different. Finally, trumpet number seven, that contains these seven vials. So all that we're looking at in these vials, that is what trumpet seven is. However, vial number seven we're going to see involves thunder, lightning, earthquake, and hail. So you can see, yeah, there's similarities, all right. But there are differences as well. We've seen that there were similar judgments in three of them. That's two, three, and six. There was one opposite judgment in four. And there's two totally ju different judgments in one and in five. So out of the seven, you've got three that are similar, one that's opposite, and two that are not similar at all. The final one, that trumpet number seven, remember it contains all seven vials. So again, that's, that's another uh, trumpet that does not match up with the seventh vial. It would match up with all of the seven vials. Okay, just wanted to cover that real quickly so you understand. Even though there are similarities between the trumpets and the vials, they are not all similar. There are some that are very different. That's one way that we can know the vials and the trumpets are not speaking about the exact same aspects of God's judgment that takes place at the second coming of Christ. All right, let's begin our study now by looking at Revelation 16 and verse number 1. Here we're going to be looking at the first four bowls of God's wrath being sent out. And remember, this time it will be sent out, you're going to notice, against Satan and his kingdoms in this world. 16.1 and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of wrath of God upon the earth. Okay, here we have God himself speaking. He's now commanding the angels. He's saying, The time has come. Now is the time for you to send my wrath against Satan and his kingdoms. Do you notice it? Uh, it's interesting. He says, Go your ways. Pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. So once again, God is emphasizing the wrath that we see falling is going to take place on the earth. This is going to be following God taking his people off of the earth to be, go home to be with him. So remember, you have no saved people on the earth at this point in time. This is simply God's wrath falling upon lost mankind who are yet located on the earth. So for example, lost men who have died prior to this, they'll be in the lake of fire at this point in time. They will not be on the earth. So the only men affected in this section of God's wrath is simply those who are living on the earth at the time the wrath falls. Okay, this is only is falling on the earth. It's not falling into the lake of fire, nor is it uh, touching those who are secure in heaven with the Lord. So keep that in mind. This is God's wrath falling against men who are living on the earth only. Verse 2. The first went, poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a, gruesome, a noisome and grievous sore. What in the world does that mean? Well, in other words, what that's saying is, it was a very painful sore. It was a very harmful sore. It was a malicious type of sore. It was a sore that truly pained and grieved and aggravated men and it was very dangerous for them to have this sore. It's a noisome and grievous sore upon men which had the mark of the beast. You notice who this is falling upon. It's men who have the mark of the beast. That's a sign of what? Their association with Satan's political kingdom. It also follows upon them who worship his image. That's talking about those who have a relation with Satan's religious kingdoms. So once again, you can see right here, this plague is directed toward lost mankind on the earth, but especially those who are closely united with the kingdoms of Satan. Remember, it's a noisome and a grievous sore that is placed upon these men. What's that teach us? If you look back in the Old Testament at the way uh, men received sores back then and what they involved, keep in mind, one of the many ways that men had sores on their body was through leprosy. 
And we know that throughout the Old Testament, leprosy is a picture of sin and how sin affects a person's body and gradually destroys a person. When we read about these sores falling upon men, one of the things we need to understand is this. When God judges mankind in the last days at the second coming of Christ, it will be the direct result of sin in their life. No man will be able to stand before the Lord and say, Lord, you're judging me wrongfully because I have not sinned against you. Lord, you're judging me wrongfully because I don't deserve this judgment. No man can ever say that. This is the direct result of sin in their life, just like leprosy that gradually eats away at a person. That's what's taking place here. These judgments are the direct result of sin in their life. But not only that, you also notice, it's interesting, the Lord sends sores against the magicians of Pharaoh's day. Remember back in the Exodus account, Pharaoh had these magicians that were constantly trying to duplicate the miracles that God's people were, were performing, Moses and Aaron. If you remember, the whole idea of the magician's miracles was to prove Moses and Aaron aren't special and their God isn't special. We can do the same thing they can. So what did God do? He sent sores upon the magicians. And as he sent sores upon the magicians, that proved to the Egyptians that were watching. You can't trust these magicians. God is making a public display of the fact that they too will be judged because of their sin. God is even uh, proving to the Egyptians through these sores that the magicians were not his servants. So as we see, the plague of sores coming upon Satan and his kingdom, what's that symbolize for us? It's the fact that Satan and his kingdoms are not of God. They are trying to duplicate the genuine kingdom of God. They're not to be followed. They will mislead you. They will deceive you just like the magicians in Pharaoh's day. So when you see these sores being sent upon Satan and his kingdom, remember, it's proving to the people, proving to us, that they're not real. They're not the real thing. They're not gods. The political empire, the religious empire of Satan is not of God. And they will only lead a person to harm when they join up with them. Let's go on. Verse number three. The second angel poured out his vial upon the sea and it became as the blood of a dead man and every living soul died in the sea. Okay, if you remember throughout our study of Revelation, several times we've seen bodies of water picturing teaching. And how these bodies of water are pictures of teaching that men take into themselves. If it's corrupt, poisonous water, as they take it in, it will result in their death. If it's life-giving water they take within themselves, it will result in them having life. Here we find the sea being judged. It becomes as the blood of a dead man. If you study that in Greek, it means the blood of a corpse. The blood of a dead body. <clears throat> if you stop and think about what the blood in a dead body must look like. It's clotted. It's not life-giving in any way. It actually would have the smell of death upon it. It would be a gruesome, horrible thing to see dead bodies drained of blood where the blood then forms a sea. Well, in this case, we have the, the God's wrath being poured out upon the sea, the, the teachings of the earth, the false teachings of Satan and his kingdoms. The bowls of wrath are poured out upon the sea and it becomes like the blood of a dead man, symbolizing to everybody what? These teachings that Satan and the kingdoms are offering to man will only lead to death. It's not life-giving blood, it's a dead blood. In comparison to the blood of Jesus Christ and the gospel message that leads men to the blood of Christ, the life-giving blood. 
So in verse number 3, as God's wrath falls against the sea, causing it to change to the blood of a dead man, what do we learn from that? God's judgments during the last day, God's judgments when Christ comes back at his second coming, another reason why they fall is to publicly display to all men. Satan and his kingdoms will only lead you to death. You know, the true nature of Satan and his kingdoms on earth are going to be revealed at this point in time. Right now, Satan is deceitful and his ministers are deceitful. Boy, his ministers will have you think that they know what's right. You know, they have the way of the truth to get to eternal life. They would say, you know, the truth about humanism, how great man is. There's many false teachings like evolution that science has come up with. Oh, you know... Satan and his kingdom make it look like yeah, evolution's true. You know, you go through the world, all the different false teachings of this world, not just religious, but in all the different areas, scientific, philosophical, psych psychological, there's many different false teachings that this world holds that originate from Satan and his kingdoms that are only harmful for man. It's those teachings that are being revealed as deadly that we find here in verse number 3. Why? The teaching of the sea that Satan lets out for all mankind to partake of is now changed to the blood of a corpse, proving this was a dead, dying teaching that will only lead to your death. Look at verse 4. The third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of water, and they became blood. Okay, prior to this we saw the sea being changed to blood, the sea being salt water. Here we have the fresh water sources being turned to blood as well. Things like the rivers and the fountains of waters. Here's where we get more into the gospel message itself. And the false gospels that Satan and his religious kingdom pro uh, propagate on this earth. Here we find that they too are changed to blood. Why? Once again, to show people... The false teaching, the false way of salvation, actually it's the many false ways of salvation. You know, there are many false gospel messages out there. All of them originate from Satan. All of them originate from his religious kingdoms. Folks, let me tell you something. Any church or any religious group that does not proclaim the true gospel of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and the need to repent and believe in him, they are false teaching. They are of Satan. Okay, I'm telling you. You point to any group that they call themselves a church or whatever they want to call themselves. If they're not teaching the true gospel message, they are a group that is empowered by Satan. And people that follow their message will die and go to hell. <clears throat> these are the groups and these are the teachings that this is pointed to. When you find the rivers and fountains of water, that's what should give life. The true gospel message, but now what? It's turned to blood. Why? Because really it wasn't the true gospel message at all. It was the false gospel message propagated by Satan and his religious kingdoms. Okay, after we find the first three bowls being poured out, look at what it says in verse 5. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which washed which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged us. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. Okay, who is the angel of the waters? Well, it seems like that's probably this third angel. Okay, because he's described as pouring his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters. So, <clears throat> in my mind, the angel that's speaking is the angel found in verse 4. The one that sends judgment against the false gospel messages of this world. The false religions of this world. What's his message? Lord, you're righteous in doing this. When you judge those who proclaim the false gospel message, you are righteous. You're not sinning in this. You're just in doing this. Because they deserve it. Thou art righteous, O Lord. That's the Lord that is the true God. He's the eternal God. Which art, wast, and shall be. Remember, throughout the Bible, not just in Revelation, but throughout the Bible, whenever the Lord is looked at as the eternal Lord, that is setting him apart from the other gods of this world. Because, folks, the other gods of this world are not eternal. 
The only true God is the only one that is eternal. For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. So what this angel is saying is this. Satan and his religious kingdom, they deserve the judgment they are receiving. Why? They're propagating false gospel, which will lead men to their death. They've abused and martyred God's people. And now they're simply giving back what they've done. They've shed the, the people of God's blood. Now their blood comes back upon them. They're only giving back what they have given out. That's why we know for, with certainty the Lord is righteous. The judgment he's sending upon Satan and his religious kingdoms in this verse that we just saw is a just type of punishment for what they've done. They've led men to spiritual death through the false gospel. They've abused God's people and the blood that they've shed was simply coming back upon them. Look at verse number 7. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. Now you have another one, another angel, this time coming out of the altar. The altar being what? The brazen altar. If you remember back, it's in Revelation chapter 6 and in chapter 8. You find the martyrs for Christ. Their blood is shed and it's pictured as them being shed at the altar. Here you have now a voice coming out of that altar where Christ's people's blood was shed. And what's his message? Yep, the Lord is righteous. Yep, the, the judgment the Lord is sending upon lost mankind and especially the religious powers of this world, the satanic religious powers of this world, it's just in them being judged in such a fashion. Why? Remember, he's coming out from the altar where the martyr's blood's just been shed. It's because God's people have been abused and mistreated and martyred by the kingdoms of this world. That's why now they deserve this judgment to come upon them. You know, many times, folks, we get in our minds the idea, oh, we can't, we can't believe that God is a God that will judge anyone. You know, how vicious and cruel and mean that must be to think that God judges people. Folks, you've got to remember something. Any judgment that God meets out against lost mankind is deserved. Just like each one of us deserved this same punishment. What's the only difference between those who are saved and those who are lost? God's gracious intervention in our lives bringing us out from lost mankind, saving us through his shed blood, granting us repentance and belief so that we can come to him, turning from our sins and come to him in faith. It's all of the Lord. It's all of his grace. So certainly we deserve that wrath just as much as any other lost person. There's nothing in us that's better than a lost person. But also we have to be honest and recognize even though we deserve that same wrath, God's grace withholds that wrath from us. However, his grace is not, I'm sorry, his wrath is not withheld from everyone. His just deserved wrath will fall upon those who do not trust in him and who do not turn from their sins in repentance and belief. Verse 8. The fourth angel now poured out his vial upon the sun and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. Throughout the Bible, and I give several verses in my notes as well as throughout history, we know the sun is probably the most worshipped of all the false gods. You know, when people worship different parts of nature like the trees or the fields or the rivers or whatever probably the sun is the most highly worshipped of all of God's nature why is that well it only makes sense you look the sun is clearly the dominant light in the sky but not only that everything on the earth relies on the sun you know you want to worship a tree okay worship a tree but remember that tree needs the sun to live you want to worship an animal? Okay, worship an animal. But remember, that animal needs the sun to live. You know, in all of these pagan, idolatrous systems, no matter what they choose to worship, they all would acknowledge, but that thing needs the sun to survive. So the sun was like the ultimate of all the gods in many of these false religions. I even give a list of some of the names of the sun gods that we're familiar with. 
The Egyptian god Ra, for example. Let me read you just a few. The Greek god Helios. The Roman god Apollo. We've all heard of these. The Hindu god Shura. And, of course, the Babylonian god Baal. All of those were sun gods. And there's many, many, many more. I just named some of them that we're probably more familiar with. Okay, here we have what? God's wrath being poured out upon the sun. And what happens? As God's wrath is poured out upon the sun, the sun turns around and scorches men with fire. Once again, what's that teach us? Men, when they dedicate their lives to serve a god of the sun, they're only going to get burnt. You know, the we have a common phrase we use in today's time. You know, if you play with fire, you get burnt. Well, this verse just changes that slightly. If you play with idolatry, you'll get burnt. God's judgment against the sun is a picture of God's judgment against idolatry. God's judgment against the sun is a picture of the fact when we submit to a false god, we are headed for pain and sorrow and misery and suffering and death. Power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And the men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God. Okay, what happens? When God turns back their false worship upon themselves. When God allows them to feel the results of their false worship that they have chosen to perform. What happens? Does that bring them closer to Christ? And do they recognize their need of salvation and their need to turn away from that false God? Not at all. What's it say? They blaspheme the name of God. They speak ill of God. Now you figure this. They worship a false god and because of that false god they're now being punished. So it's that false god's fault. It's between them who made the choice to worship the false god and the false god itself. They're now simply being given back what they have given to the false god. But instead of them blaming themselves for choosing to worship the false god and instead of them blaming the false god for leading them astray what do they say? They blaspheme the true God. How dare he send his wrath upon us? How dare he allow our idol worship to come back and hurt us? See? Even when they feel the hand of God's judgment, they do not repent. Men scorch with great heat, blaspheme the name of God, which had power over these plagues. See, that's their argument. Look, the Lord didn't have to judge us. He's the one with judging us. He's the one with the power over these plagues, so we're going to blame him. We're not blaming ourselves for the decisions we made in life. We're not blaming those who misled us through all these false gospel messages and the different teachings of this world. We're not blaming them either. We're going to blame the just, holy God of heaven. We're going to blame him for judging us because he's the one with the power over the judgments which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him the glory. Once again, and we saw this in other places in Revelation, even after God's wrath falls upon them, they choose to do what? To not repent, and to not give him the glory. What a sad illustration of lost mankind and the condition lost mankind is in. Even in the middle of God's hand of judgment upon them, they choose to not repent and not give God the glory. Why? They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually blinded. They, have, they don't have the ability to understand apart from God's grace being shown to them in their life. Folks, once again I remind you, each one of us is in that same shape. Each one of us were just as lost as these men we're reading about now. And yet, if we've been saved by God's grace, we know we've escaped this wrath that's to come. We've been given a <clears throat> spiritual understanding and the ability to understand spiritual truths. We've had our eyes opened, our sin-blinded eyes were opened to show us who the true Lord and Savior really is. What a blessing it is to know that through the gracious intervention of the Lord in our life, He has delivered us from these things we've been reading about this morning. But likewise, folks, if we understand that we've been delivered from these things, let's really appreciate what the Lord has done for us. Let's love Him and show Him our love 
by serving him faithfully as those who are called out of this world to be servants and to be ministers of his glory to those who are around us. Thank you very much for joining me in this lesson. May the Lord bless you as you study his word.